Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Good morning to KSWV Radio. It's our distinct honor and privilege to be visiting with New Mexico Highlands University today. We're going to be visiting with Robert Anaya, who is the New Mexico Highlands University Santa Fe Center Manager, as well as Dr. Kimberly Blea, who is the Dean of Students at New Mexico Highlands University. Welcome to the both of you. Thank you, Esteban. Hello, thanks for having me on today. It sure is great to see you both, and thank you for spending some time with our listening audience today and with many of our viewers here uh, in Santa Fe and in northern New Mexico. Obviously, big shout-outs to uh, the communities of Las Vegas and all the northern communities like Española, Rio Rancho, Los Alamos, everybody. Any shout-outs that you guys want to give? I think you covered it. The, the state of New Mexico, I know you guys have a broad reach, and so we're we're excited to be here with you again on Que Suave, Esteban. Robert, it's always a fun time to be able to spend some time with many of the wonderful guests that you bring to the program. And Dr. Kimberly Blea, another wonderful uh, special guest that we're going to have as part of today's program. Robert, let's tee up the conversation for our listeners out there. So uh, tell us how we're going to be um, moving forward with our conversation with uh, Dr. Blea. I think it's awesome, and I'd like to just start off by uh, allowing Dr. Blair to briefly introduce herself to our listening audience. And uh, and I'm Robert Anaya from the center manager, uh, center manager from Santa Fe, as you said. And and uh, I'll defer to you for an uh, introduction. Dr. Great, Blair. Dr. Blair, welcome. Tell us all about yourself, my friend. So thanks, Esteban, and thanks, Robert, for having me on today. Um, so I have the great privilege and honor of serving as the Dean of Students at New Mexico Highlands University, and um, that encompasses a lot. Um, the position that I hold is a position that is very important um, to the experience that our students have with Highlands, but on a more personal, personal note, it's um, very important to me. I'm very honored and humbled to serve in this capacity. Um, and I really see it as a way, uh, being a Highlands graduate, I really see it as a way in which I'm able to um, be in service to um, the students, but also to the institution that has provided so much to me as well as to my family. You know, uh, Dr. Blair and Robert, if I may, it's always a, a source of pride for me when I see um, a Latina with the doctor in front of it. And it's something that is a special uh, recognition for my daughter to look at our leaders in the academic field. And Dr. Blea, uh, you know, your life's journey and what it means to not only to little Latinas like my daughter, but to many people out there. Um, can you just maybe share a little bit about your life's journey and to becoming Dr. Blea, and, and who, who motivated you to, you know, strive uh, to do what you do? Uh, thank you, Esteban. So um, I, I don't want to uh, bore you all with my whole life history, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of context and background and really share with you my educational journey um, to, as you said, to inspire um, others um, who can relate and who can identify the way that I do to see the sense of possibility um, in themselves. I say this to all our students who are going on to professional and doctoral programs. I did it, so can you. Um, and so um, basically, um, I, I grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, my family is actually from Ojo Feliz. It's about 40 minutes from Las Vegas um, in Mora County. Um, and um, I went to Robertson High School. I graduated from Robertson High School. And like many of our students locally say, oh, I want to leave Las Vegas and I want to go to the big city. I want to get away. I need something different. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I originally um, left um, Las Vegas and I went to Las Cruces and I enrolled as a first time freshman at New Mexico State. And I really, um, I, I struggled being able to adapt into that large city, but a, a, a larger, you know, university. And it was, it was difficult for me because I'm very close to my family and I was a itty bitty fish in a, a I wouldn't even say a pond, that's like a giant lake. And so uh, for me, um, I decided that it was best for me to uh, return back to Las Vegas um, and enroll at Highlands. Um, 
I was um, familiar with the campus, obviously, you know, being here in Las Vegas, but um, my dad actually uh, worked at the university and um, he retired from the university, worked in the uh, facilities department as a general maintenance manager. And so I was uh, familiar and aware of the university and knew about opportunities that um, I could attend and whatnot. So um, I, I returned to Las Vegas. I enrolled at Highlands. Um, and like so many of our students, um, I got a, a, a work study position, a student employment position. And um, I, I really used it as an opportunity to um, get to, you know, familiarize myself with the campus but also to root myself and, and be connected. Um, I found different opportunities uh, to get involved. Um, and, and also, you know, I think this is important to note, many of our students are not able to um, just go to school and that's it, they have to work. And um, so I did a, a work study position, but I also had another uh, part-time position off campus um, and I, began working. Um, I actually had the privilege of working at the facility services department in the front desk. And I tell you, if you want to understand and know how a university operates, um, the buildings, the infrastructure, that's the place to be. And so I, I learned a lot. I was given um, a lot of responsibilities in that role, uh, but it also taught me how to handle things, you know, really quickly um, and uh, uh, on the fly and, and, and how really how to multitask. Fast forward, I um, was continuing to work um, two part-time jobs, work study in an off-campus position. And um, in the last year of my undergraduate degree, I um, you know, was looking for some more uh, fiscal stability for me. And I said, you know what? I know a lot about the university. I'm gonna apply for a position within the registrar's office. And so I applied for a position within the registrar's office and I was hired as a entry level position as a registration specialist. And so I was able to do that and finish my undergraduate degree. And I got my undergraduate degree in um, political science with a pre-law emphasis. And oh, here I am again, I wanna go to law school. But being the type of person that I am, and I'm very, as I said, close to my family and needing that connection, I um, said, I'm only applying to UNM Law School because um, I can't move that far away. And so um, I applied to UNM Law School while things happen or don't happen the way that they need to. And I, I definitely believe in that. And so I was not admitted into um, law school. And I said, okay here's an uh, opportunity for me, what can I do next? Because I was working at the university, um, I had the opportunity to uh, take classes through a tuition remission program. So I started my master's program right away and um, I worked full time. I applied for another position within the registrar's office in which I was um, working specifically and directly with our center students. And so it gave me that opportunity gave me the uh, specific insight and perspective to understand how our center students um, experience their interactions with the main campus, uh, but also from an academic perspective and, you know, from the registration process to the um, completion of their degree. And so I worked specifically with the center students as well. And then from there, I moved on and, um, was able to, um, I moved on and um, was able to continue my master's degree. I finished my master's degree in uh, public affairs with a concentration in applied sociology. And I did my master's thesis around, um, I did a program evaluation of a domestic violence service provider um, and looking at the cultural competencies and context in which they're providing services. Uh, but specifically as it relates to uh, Nuevo Mexicano culture and, and how they were providing programming. And so um, ar around, you know, sometime after that, the university, um, a, a faculty member, Dr. Erica Durkis, applied for a grant, a federal grant through the Office of uh, Violence Against Women through the Department of Justice uh, to start a campus advocacy program. And so um, mm -hmm. I applied and I was hired as the uh, founding director of the Campus Violence Prevention Program. And then throughout the years, I was able to um, 
write additional grants um, and expand our services to ensure that we were including our center students. Um, also um, writing additional grants and having the opportunity to um, expand to provide substance abuse uh, prevention uh, for San Miguel County as a whole. While being the type of person that I am, I've always been one who wants to be challenged and um, both personally and professionally. And so, um, you know, I had been writing some grants and that was fun and exciting, but I wanted something more um, personally fulfilling. And so um, looking at, you know, different um, doctoral programs that I wanted to do, um, I, I, I explored a few, but the one that was of uh, particular interest to me was the um, educational leadership program at the University of New Mexico. Um, and this is a really great program um, in particular because it brings together practitioners. So it's a, a doctorate of education and it brings practitioners together who are in higher education, but also K through 12. And so I, I applied to the position, uh, excuse me, I applied to the program and was accepted. And um, I can't tell you, I learned so much about the education system from, you know, pre-K all the way uh, through higher education um, and learned a lot from my K through 12 colleagues. And so um, I, I, I did that um, during the um, during the last year of my coursework in my program. I um had I, I had the privilege, um, my predecessor, Dr. Trujillo, as the Dean of Students left the university and our current president, President Minner, asked me if I would be interested in serving in an interim capacity as the Dean of Students. And I, um, he, he, he also said, when, when are you gonna be done with your program, you know, what, with your doctoral program? And I say, I say this all the time, like a tonta, not knowing, you know, really what it takes. I said, okay, I have, you know, I'm finishing coursework one year to finish my dissertation. Um, and being, you know, uh, the first in my family, you know, to um, pursue a doctorate degree, um, not understanding the, really what is required of a dissertation. I did a master's thesis, but this is a whole nother level. And, and not understanding that I, I say like a tonta, just saying, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it. But I really see it as a blessing in disguise because what it did was provided me with um, an opportunity to, for one, um, keep my commitment and um, honor my word that I gave to President Minner that I would complete my degree in in my dissertation in one additional year. And um, as crazy and chaotic and as difficult and stressful as it was, I kept my word and I, I finished my um, uh, doctoral program um, within three years, believe it or not. And so um, it was tough. It was challenging. Um, I also have a husband. And at the time, my daughter was about 14 months old when I started my program. Um, and I couldn't have done it without um, his support and the support of family who helped and, you know, really just understands the importance of, you know, me going on to get this additional education that helps to support my family. So long story short, always looking for opportunities, um, seeing that sense of possibility um, that others before me have gone and, and shared with me, uh, but also ensuring that I reach back um, and pull those others with me. So something that's really important to me and uh, my position for students that I support, um, but also staff members and others at the university who have aspirations to go on to a doctoral program or to law school, you know, reminding them that there's going to be times in which you're going to doubt yourself because those types of programs are not designed and set up for people who look like me, who identify as a Latina, who comes from little Las Vegas or Ojo Feliz. And so reassuring them that I did it, so can they. Um, in a nutshell, that's kind of my educational and professional journey thus far. Um, I'm happy to say that in August, I'll be celebrating 15 years at working at Highlands, and it's been a great privilege and honor to do that. Um, and, and because of the opportunities um, that Highlands has provided to me, as I said, I, you know, really 
showing me that um, a Highlands education really does um, set you on a, a path for a great life. Um, but also my husband is a Highlands alum. He got his degree from Highlands as well. And so for us, you know, it's really about um, giving back to HU um, and, and sharing, you know, our story, like this is an opportunity to do that. But really, you know, in ensuring that students understand that they have that sense of possibility to really do anything that they want. Yeah. Well, you know, I am I am so impressed. Uh, Dr. Blea, again, we're visiting with Dr. Blea, uh, Kimberly Blea, Dean of Students at New Mexico Highlands University, and Robert Anaya, the Santa Fe Center Manager for New Mexico Highlands University. And if we just kind of take a look, uh, this is very impressive. Uh, I see here at the New Mexico Highlands website, you can read all about uh, Dr. Kimberly Blea and uh, her background. But uh, Dr. Blea, uh, I am telling you, listening to you gives me a few, and Robert, important things in life. Number one, the observation I made about you being on campus with your dad when you're a little girl uh, told me that that was important. With your dad's work, uh, what he did for the Highlands University made an impression on you when you're uh, a little girl going to work with him. Number two, you like to work hard or you work hard. <laughs> and there's a value of hard work that was instilled in you. And that's obvious because you worked and went to school at the same time. And then the other thing that I recognize, Dr. Blay, is that uh, you uh, had the wisdom to pick the right environment for you, for your, and for your academic and for your learning. And Robert, we've talked about this on this program. The value of New Mexico Highlands University, obviously higher education, quality education, but a very welcoming environment for students to feel comfortable in being able to pursue uh, their uh, education and then their career paths. And then um, and then caring, caring for others. So Robert, these are just some of the takeaways and observations that I made listening to Dr. Blea, and I just want to uh, open it up for you to share some of your thoughts. No, that's absolutely. I think you you did a excellent summation of, of and you, Dr. Blea, I mean, you gave UNM another chance to to make the right decision. So, good job in 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 going back and taking care of that, and them recognizing uh, uh, that they needed to bring you in, and you would complete the way you did. I I didn't realize I, I've known you for several years and uh, consider you a, a colleague and a friend. Uh, I didn't realize how similar our pathways were. Um, you know, I, I I too was in the same programs at Highlands that you were, and. Uh, you know, it really, I've shared it on this show, it, it it provided me a good perspective as I went out into the workforce and, and spent a little time working in state and local government and even the private sector. But Dr. Blair, you, you, you talked about something that I would like you to, if you could, um, maybe expand on. You, you've done a lot of work with students um, that have, you know, that are, that are upset or challenged or concerned or scared or all the things that you know we ourselves at one time or another face you you spoke about your early challenge uh in making a decision to to, co to come to new mexico highlands university uh, but can you speak a little more to what happens for those students because a lot of the people that we're we're talking to right now are uncertain as as you know very well and and are not sure you know who who would they go to and what experiences might they encounter and how can they get the information they need? Can you, can you get into a little more of, of who you went to and, and maybe not by person, but by area and then kind of how we have wraparound services that, that can help people on that pathway and get them on that journey uh, where they want to go with their education. So um, absolutely, Robert, thank you. And thank you, Estevan, um, for your summation of my experiences. I, I, I think you're on point. Uh, work ethic is definitely key to my success. And that was something that was instilled in me very early on in being able to um, observe and, and learn from my dad. Um, so, so thank you for recognizing that. Um, regarding um, kind of who or what, 
what type of person, I, I guess I can't say in particular, one particular person at HU um, because there's pockets of those people everywhere. You just have to find your person. Um, we always say this and it, it's it's not a, a catchphrase at all, but we are the Highlands family. Uh, we really do uh, provide that uh, care and guidance and support to our students. And so I can speak to, you know, specifically for me, in um, you know, identifying who those people were. Um, when I was a student, um, I recall uh, my uh, student um, em uh, employment supervisor, um, and Robert, you're gonna get a kick out of this, but Priscilla Ortega Mathis, she was the, um, she was the administrative assistant in the facility services department, and, and she's still with the university, and now she's the um, executive administrative assistant for the provost. And so um, Priscilla taught me early on um, a, a lot of um, a lot of skills and um, it just just really, you know, how to be diplomatic and professional in, in my work. Um, but also um, she was a, and still is, you know, a, a trusted person. And I think that's the key, you know, to emphasize, you know, I had also other people at the time I was involved in a student senate um, and our Dean of Students and Vice President of Student Affairs at the time, uh, Judy uh, Cordova Romero, um, really helped in um, providing that additional support. Um, it's really cool now, Yvonne Duran, she's the um, administrator, she was at the time the administrative assistant to the Dean of Students, and now she's my administrative assistant. So I had the privilege of, you know, having her as a trusted person when I was a student. And, and now she's that uh, trusted person as my colleague and my assistant in my position now. And so, you know, really just um, emphasizing that there are um, different people that really serve to support students, um, to help guide and, and navigate them um, navigate our students through whatever issues they might have. So really, you know, in speaking to students, it's just finding who your person is at HU. Um, that may be Robert at the Santa Fe Center. Um, that may be Michelle Bencomo. She's our student relations coordinator. She's a great resource for students who may not otherwise have a specific person. She will help students get connected. Um, so I, I think it's really a matter of identifying who that person is, um, and it can be just building a relationship with them, um, or it can be a f for a specific purpose. If you have an issue or concern that you know you need some support with, we definitely have um, great staff who really um, will work to um, provide guidance to our students. Um, so that that's what I would say specifically about who those people are. Um, now, I don't know if you want me to elaborate, Robert, on um, kind of some of the different services that we offer for students. A absolutely. I, before you do that, I just wanted to say this uh, spot on with all your comments about how we put our arms around students and want to, you know, we want to help them with their success and, and, and find your own person. But the one thing that we have at Highlands University that's that that I think is, is unique in, in many ways is that we have students and faculty that come from all parts of the country and even the world, but we also have uh, students, faculty, staff, and administration that are that are actually from uh, a lot of New Mexico. So you could you can find a person that's from Ojo Feliz or Mora or Galiste or Santa Fe or Española right there at the university that you could actually go speak with and talk to about their journey and their pathway and their experiences that you can relate to that's from back home. But yeah, by all means, uh, Dr. Blea, if you could really speak to the, to the, to the services we provide students and how those, those services are extended, not just to uh, on campus, but, but center students as well. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I, I, I try to, you know, speak in, um, in, in a comprehensive way. Um, I oversee um, many different departments and uh, services um, at Highlands. Um, and some of those are um, actual physical spaces, you know, at the main campus. So I oversee all our um, residence halls. Um, 
I oversee our outdoor recreation center, our fitness center, game room. Um, I oversee our swimming pool. Um, and I'm thinking of physical spaces. I also oversee um, our contract with El Centro Family Health. Um, and they've been a, a partner with us for at least 20 years, even before they were El Centro Family Health. It was Health Centers of Northern New Mexico. Um, and they provide services to our students, uh, both medical uh, services as well as behavioral health and counseling services. Um, and so I also oversee that um, the student health clinic. Uh, I oversee our bookstore. Um, I oversee our um, um, advocacy center, which is HU Cares. Um, HU Cares, as I mentioned, um, I had the privilege and honor of of uh, developing and, and growing that program from the ground up. And so um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about HU Cares, uh, but really HU Cares is, is really the place in which um, students themselves can um, seek out support for um, just any area or concerns of well-being. Um, sometimes students are dealing with the law, both uh, personally, but also academically. And sometimes the stressors of that can, can be challenging for students. And that's okay. You know, that's why we have the uh, resources in place. And so we have HU Cares. Um, you know, it, they do a lot of uh, what we call prevention work as well as it relates to uh, sexual assault and uh, domestic and dating violence and stalking, as well as uh, suicide prevention and just overall general well-being for students. Um, and they provide direct services as well. And so sometimes students can seek out those services directly, uh, but also um, we'll get referrals from a faculty member, a staff member, a concerned friend. And so we have a team um, that's also called Student Behavioral Intervention and Support Team that will reach out and um, we do like a case management in which we identify who's the best person and most appropriate person to reach out and offer those support services um, in a proactive and intentional way for our students to make sure that their well-being is taken care of. Um, a lot of the work that we do is really meant, and, and the way we frame how we support students at HU um, and student affairs is to ensure we're supporting students' holistic development and well-being. Right. So we look at things from a um, from a physical well-being perspective. I mentioned, you know, all our recreational facilities and you know medical services available to students. Um, we talk about. Um, social well-being we do a ton of things as it relates to programming and events for students you know we've hosted we've had um, a different uh, large concerts on campus where we've brought in some large um, entertainers and we fill the wilson complex and we get people from all over northern new mexico to come to vegas and uh to attend these events uh, but we also do things that are more culturally focused and specific to um you know ballet we've brought in um, um folklorico dancers we've brought in um um mariachi groups um um, Mariachi Reina de Los Angeles we brought in one year, we've brought in black violin, um, and we invite all our students from all locations uh, to come to those events. Um, and so we, we, we try to do a lot to, to create um, environments and uh, connections for students to have that uh, social well-being and, and really the HU experience, uh, but we also are looking at things um, and, and understanding that um, financial well-being is something that our students um, should have the support necessary to understand. So we not only want to support them um, to understand, you know, what they need to do to ensure they can attend from semester to semester, that they have, you know, financial aid completed, that they have a payment plan in place, but also setting them up for, you know, long-term success so they can um, have great lives of meaning and purpose, but be, you know, uh, financially ready to do that. And so uh, we're very fortunate and privileged. I also oversee the Center for Professional Development and Career Readiness, um, and we, this past legislative session, we received some funding from the um, legislature through um, our PSP money, which is 
research projects and sponsored projects, research programs and sponsored projects. I always get that mixed up, but it was a specific um, earmark funding and allocation that really expanded what uh, we are doing with our career services office. And so uh, what that does now is we are um, establishing a um, what we call a co-curricular transcript. And this is really exciting because this extends to all students um, regardless of their location. Um, and so basically what a career or a co-curricular transcript does is it documents a student's experience um, at Highlands outside of the academic classroom, right? We have academic transcripts that say our students get a degree in whatever it might be, but what the co-curricular transcript is meant to do is to complement the um, academic transcript, right? And so it tells a complete picture as to what our students are doing as part of their Highlands experience. And it creates pathways um, in which students can accomplish different um, tracks, so to speak. Um, and they can present that to an employer um, when they're applying for jobs or applying for internships or applying for a graduate program or a professional program. And it pr provides a complete picture. We also are able to um, assist students with um, obviously a meaningful student employment experience, whether that be at our, our center campuses or, or on the main campus in Las Vegas. Um, we're also able to assist students with applying for uh, jobs and internships from resume writing to um, doing um, interview prep. Um, we recently, and you know, we've shifted and transitioned with COVID, uh, but we've been able to host virtual career fairs. And so um, that has been something that I know all our students have uh, really enjoyed is being able to meet with prospective employers um, in a virtual environment. And so students don't have to come up to Las Vegas for our in-person career fair like we normally have, but they're able to, you know, meet with, I, I know a new employer we had this spring was Sandia Labs. Uh, we always have Los Alamos Labs part of there, but we have the FBI. So we have national, we have state um, entities as well. We have school districts who are looking for educators. You know, I, I know in years past, we have, you know, the state of New Mexico looking for social workers. And so you name it, whatever type of um, degree our students have, we have employers who want HU students, who, who want to recruit them. And um, so we're working to, to prepare our students, you know, to have a career, to be prepared for that career, uh, but then also uh, for assistance in obtaining um, that um, first destination, that job, you know, post-graduation. So really yeah. looking at, at things from that perspective. So we offer a, a number of, of things for our HU students. You know, uh, do, uh, Dr. Blea and Robert, I'm so impressed uh, that uh, there is a lot of work and effort behind the scenes to complement the classroom experience with all of this other experience that you're talking about, programs and life experience on campus virtually, uh, because that's what students love, but that's also in a way to motivate to stay engaged. And the longer someone's engaged, the longer they're going to commit to to doing their coursework or to following through or to finishing. So you're making it a, a fun and engaging experience for the student. Robert? Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on, Estevan. And, and I wanted to speak uh, to some of the HU CARES component that, that our students get at the center. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Latasha Burbank and others have come to our center on a regular basis to speak to students about other challenges that they're facing that sometimes don't have anything to do with school at all, but maybe have to do with some of the personal behavioral challenges they're facing or needs that they might have, or frankly, they just want to talk. And so it's truly a family and a collective across the campus of several components and players and people that have worked to provide a, an experience for the student that, that covers the full gamut. And so as, as you were speaking, uh, Dr. Blair, I was thinking about a lot of parents that listen to this radio program and, and even students or people considering maybe going to main campus. Um, 
Uh, you guys will get there pretty quick here with with those youngsters that you have. But could you give some maybe feedback that can provide a little assurance to uh, the parents out there that might be listening and tell them a little bit about what that experience looks like or what they might expect moving into making the decision of even going to the campus for a campus visit and and what what the uh, the the life is like in the as a as a resident on campus. Uh, a lot of times we we don't talk as much about that experience, and it'd be nice if you could share with those parents and potential students kind of what they would do and kind of what it looks like once they would get the Highlands or thinking about those decisions that they're going to make to to maybe go to Highlands University at, at main campus. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, I do recognize that um, HU is, is quite uh, unique in which we have a, a very diverse population of students. You know, we have our adult learners who are, you know, going, you know, perhaps to one of our centers mm -hmm. in order to obtain another degree for uh, career mobility. Uh, we have our traditional age um, students, um, those, you know, 18 to 24 year olds is what we call them, um, who, who may want that traditional college experience. And so um, I'm always mindful that we have different populations of students, but in particular, when I'm speaking to what does the um, main campus traditional experience look like? Um, so we've done a lot um, in, in my time as the Dean of Students uh, to really ensure that um, students that come to Highlands to live on campus or live locally in Las Vegas, but who really want to experience a, a traditional college um, experience have all the opportunity to, to do that. Um, we've instituted um, a, a campus life initiative and good golly, it's already been, um, I think about going on five years, um, but that's a, a fund, a, a student fee that was set up specifically uh, to enhance that experience. And what we did was um, uh, establish an outdoor recreation center, which I, I, I think is um, one of the really, great things about Highlands because of where we're located, just right on the eastern slopes of the Sangre de Cristo mountain. We have, you know, the beautiful mountains, uh, Story Lake, outdoor recreation, uh, Sipapu, uh, ski resort is close by. Uh, but I always like to share that if, if you want to be in the outdoors, mm -hmm. you can do that um, by going to Highlands and we support you in doing that. Um, we have equipment rentals in which students can check out at no cost, additional cost to them. Um, during non-COVID times, we uh, take students and it's probably our greatest, um, our greatest outdoor excursion is we take students on the weekends to Sipapu. We oh, pay for, fun. yeah, we pay for their lift ticket, for their rentals of equipment. Um, we even, uh, because we have students who come from out of state and even out of country, they don't have, you know, the um, gear that they need. And so we even uh, loan out to students uh, uh, snow pants and jackets. And so students can learn, they can take lessons and learn to ski, learn to snowboard. Um, we also, and, and students love that. We provide transportation out there. Um, but we also have coordinated excursions where we take, you know, students out. Uh, we do an annual hike up to Hermit's Peak. Uh, we do a... Uh, a guided hike uh, to Tent Rocks. Uh, we've taken students all the way down to White Sands. Uh, we go to the Blue Hole in Santa Rosa, you know, just really getting students to experience the land um, and the outdoors in Northern New Mexico. Um, we, you know, have, um, um, a, a, I don't want to say brand new, but a revitalized uh, fitness center, uh, thanks to our legislative um, leadership fellowship program from last year in which students um, ex went and um, advocated for funds at the state legislature, we were able to um, um, provide some new equipment in our fitness center. So if, you know, exercise is your jam, then we have, you know, the new latest and greatest um, equipment for students um, in our, at our Archuleta Fitness Center. We also have a, a 
a totally redone game room. Uh, students haven't been able to experience that yet, but when students come in, uh, we'll have all, we have all new gaming systems, new uh, television set up um, in our game room located in the student union building. Um, I wanna speak a, a little bit to living on campus. As I mentioned, I also oversee the residence halls. And so uh, for anybody who's interested in living on campus, we have um, a variety of um, types of residence halls. So we have uh, Viles and Crimmins Residence Hall, which is a, a suite style living. So there's a bedroom, bathroom, and a common area. Um, and they range in size from doubles to quads, which means there's four rooms, two restrooms, and a common area. Um, that's Viles and Crimmins Residence Hall. Um, it's our newest residence hall. Uh, we also have Malady Hall, which is a, um, a, a single bedroom with a, a shared restroom. You know, we're two to three rooms, share a restroom. Um, we also have um, the Kennedy Hall Complex, um, which is primarily where our um, uh, upper division students and graduate students live because there's it's a, a single bedroom, single uh, restroom, um, kind of like an apartment, um, but um, not as, uh, as large as our apartments. Uh, we have campus apartments, Greg and Eric House, which um, uh, for, for those who, you know, some of the parents who may be listening, those used to be called family housing. Um, now what we see is more of our older students who uh, want to live in apartments. So it's a two bedroom, uh, one bathroom, kitchen, uh, um, and living room apartment. And we also have Connor Hall. Connor Hall is our um, traditional style residence hall, which is a long corridor of rooms and then a community restroom. And I'm really happy and proud to say that now during, you know, um, the pandemic and when we don't have as many students on campus, uh, we've been able to renovate Connor Hall. So, um, I, I, I went uh, recently to campus to to take a look at those renovations that were completed. And um, my husband actually lived in Connor Hall 210B. And I say that all the time because now, it, it, you know, I, I get to see, you know, that uh, specifically how it's been renovated and, you know, everything, you know, from the um, flooring to the restrooms, our uh, facility services mm -hmm. uh, team really did a great job in managing that project for us. And so really reinvesting in the infrastructure of our residence halls um, and other places on campuses, what we've done, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity um, now during the pandemic when there's not as many uh, students on campus to ensure that when our students are able to return, that they are able to um, have a, a very nice uh, physical environment to enjoy. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've you know put up digital signage across campus. We've implemented Xfinity streaming service. So students have access to that who live on campus. And so we've really done a lot to um, enhance and improve the, um, the HU experience from the environment perspective. You know, uh, Dr. Blea and Robert, I am encouraged um, and what I'm seeing uh, in the headlines as far as the uh, vaccination rollout and some of the information that's coming out saying uh, the president expects that there'll be uh, enough vaccines for every adult by the end of May. Now, I, I know that we're he's moving up that timeline. And so I'm thinking, OK, May, June, July, August, you know, semester starts in August. But whether it give or take a month. Um, and they're even talking about starting to roll out the Johnson and Johnson vaccine for children less than 18 years of age by September. So a lot of this progress being made, I can only imagine there's a lot of anticipation and excitement around the possibility of maybe another, you know, wave of people being able to go on campus by August. I'm, I'm sure that maybe, uh, that's your excitement, obviously, there at Highlands. But tell us a little bit about what you're thinking, uh, looking, you know, a month, two, three, four down the road. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Estevan, because you're you're absolutely right. And I know as Robert can attest to this, um, it's it's almost been a year since the university mm -hmm. and Dr. Minner, President Minner, had um, 
it declared an emergency and we activated our um, emergency operations center. Um, I think this is helpful for, for people to um, understand um, our preparedness level at HU. So um, we've been operating under the incident command structure and our emergency operations center um, has been activated almost a year. So every um, decision, every response that we've had, everything we've done from a planning perspective has been coordinated in a way to ensure that all of the individuals um, are voices are being heard, represented, and considered. Um, and, and we meet multiple times a week. Um, everything, for, you know, from we have a medical branch that's looking at, you know, our response to positive cases or our uh, testing components or the vaccination rollout. Every Everything from that perspective is um, always considered. We have another team that's looking at it from the academic perspective, and um, that's led by one of our mm -hmm. academic deans, and we have faculty members who are part of our team as well. And so looking at it from that perspective, Perspective. Um, we, you know, we have, you know, human resources um, on board. So looking at it from the employee perspective, um, I say all of this because um, we're having the conversations about what does the future look like, right? And so I, I feel very confidently that because we have been operating um, in a very coordinated way. Um, we anticipate being able to go back to in-person learning in the fall. Um, that's what we're planning for. Um, however, we recognize that um, as the you know um, science uh, it dictates what we do and the uh, State Department of Health, the public health order, as well as the CDC, we'll pivot and transition as we need to and we're prepared and equipped to do that. Um, I, I will also say mm -hmm. that um, we, you know, have followed what um, HED, the higher education department, we've prepared and submitted, you know, all the necessary COVID safe practices and the plans for everything from the residence halls to intercollegiate athletics to the academic classrooms to, you know, everything we're doing from screening, uh, training. Robert was very involved with our uh, training team in particular in set setting up online training for anybody who is going to be working on campus or coming onto campus to include uh, HU employees and students, to also include any vendors or contractors they're working with, all have to complete these um, COVID safe practice training to ensure that they know what is expected of them. And so as we're planning, you know, we, we want to um, lead with, you know, the, the, the hope that we'll get back to um, a sense of normalcy, um, but we also are realistic to understand that the safety of the Highlands community, our students, our staff, our faculty administrators ha has and will continue to be at the key of decisions that are made moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. But we do, you know, we're, we're optimistic, uh, but we're also realistic. We, you know, we're keeping a close eye on the, you know, variants. Um, we have local data uh, statewide and even trends that we're seeing, you know, at colleges um, in the state of New Mexico, but also nationwide. And those are things that we're conversating about to help us inform um, our decisions in, in moving forward. You know, uh, Dr. Blea, uh, Robert, uh, I asked the question and boom, Dr. Blea just went into action. You know, man, Highland just prepared. You got this down. I mean, oh, yeah. the uh, all the planning taking place, but being able to be nimble to pivot if you need to. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're 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 getting ready. Uh, you're uh, getting set for the students. But if you need to, as you say, when you're talking with uh, PED, the 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 higher education department and the public health department and all everything, and then you're keeping an eye on the variants, as we know, hopefully, you know, the vaccines rolling out will start taking care of a lot of that. But, you know, these variants that are spinning off. But Dr. Blea, I mean, Robert, listening to, her, to Dr. Blea is like, man, they're on it. They're on it. Absolutely, Esteban. She's she's been at the at the top of the spear relative to our emergency operations planning, and and uh, it's been a co collective, comprehensive effort with, you know, uh, the experts that need to be on the group to help make the decisions to keep everyone safe and do the appropriate contact tracing and, and what we need to do. 
what it, what it, what uh, COVID has done though, I want to put a shout out to uh, all of our family at, at HU and talk about our online programs. Uh, we, we were nimble and we adjusted and uh, we had uh, you know, the silver lining, if you will, from the COVID was um, that we had access for students across the whole university to take classes they might not otherwise have been able to take in a, in a different online format. And so uh, right now uh, our summer semester is open for registration. And so as always, we want to make sure and encourage uh, our, the listening audience uh, and people that, that might watch this uh, podcast to say, uh, come to Highlands, www.nmhu.edu is where you can find all the information you need, even the contact information uh, for the centers, uh, for respective programs. As always, I'm available. My team is available, as is the whole university, to guide you to the appropriate program of study, put you in contact with admissions, with financial aid, with the registrar, with HU Cares, or anybody that you need to uh, to get you on your path and your journey. One, one story, Esteban, that I wanted to share was uh, it's it was a couple months back. Uh, that we were doing a program and we always talk about not just new students, but returning students, you know, students that maybe started their journey and, and uh, had to go to work for many reasons for, for their family and, and, you know, whatever the reasons might be, but they started their program and they want to come back and finish. We always encourage people like that, regardless of the university that you may have attended or college to send us, uh, give us a call. Get us in, in touch with your uh, unofficial transcripts. We can uh, do some initial review of your transcripts and and uh, uh, give you a good op option and opportunity to consider coming back to school. Well, we had an individual that actually called you and said, you know, what can I do? It was a, a former uh, master's level business student that we had that, that had done uh, almost the whole program. And uh, because of experiences and needs in his family he had to stop going to school and so uh he had to to make the decision to to try and, and come back and he did and i'm happy to say he worked closely with our uh numerous people including people from the center but our new dean of the school of business and many others and i can you know tell you you know, you know we're excited he's on a pathway to finish up uh, his master's degree and, and on a pathway to get currency on some of those classes that that were older that he needed. But uh, just an example of we're here, you know, we're here to get that information. We're here to give you an assessment of, of what we think we have available to you. And like we've said on prior programs, if if our pathway isn't the best for you, but we can help you link to another school or another university, we're okay with that too, right? We, we, our game is to make you, put you in the best possible position you can to, to succeed and con and continue and finish that pathway. So, um, but right now, summer registrations on. Uh, you can go to the website. You can look at courses, and then we can uh, discuss and begin uh, a, a verbal conversation or an online conversation. Uh, we're all Zoom. Zoomers now and Zoom experts, and, and I think uh, society has society adapted to that, but we also have other social media mechanisms the, through the university that, that we work with to, to try and uh, be up with the times, if you will. And, and so, I don't know, uh, Dean Blay, if you want to speak to maybe some of, some of those things that we do for, for students to, to maintain contact and communication with them uh, through your shop. Sure. Um, probably the, uh, one of the, or there's a couple ways. Um, e currently, email is uh, easiest for for me myself. Uh, my email address is dean of students at nmhu edu. Um, but I, I will also add that off of the uh, website uh, we have what's called live chat. Um, and Michelle Bencomo is our student relations coordinator. Uh, she does uh, respond to live chat. So if somebody has questions about something or who they should contact, um, 
There is uh, Michelle who answers that specifically, uh, but we've also implemented uh, in partnership with our um, ITS uh, Information Technology Services Department, what's called Chatbot. And Chatbot's really cool. It's um, artificial intelligence in which um, individuals are able to um, kind of, you know, you start chatting a question and it starts, you know, feeding and, and answering um, your questions, right? As, as, and it, and it's, um, it, it does it in a way in which people can get access to information quickly that they don't want to necessarily um, go through, search a website or contact somebody. So there's also um, that area um, on our website as well for us. Uh, for current students to do that, as well as uh, prospective students. A lot of questions we get um, are in regards to financial aid. Um, and so there's a lot of um, pre-built questions in there that regular type of questions that students have about financial aid, about the admissions process, about student accounts, about living on campus, you name it. So there's, there's lots of ways to connect with us um, and um, just, you know, feel free to reach out uh, to me, like I said, Adina students at nmhu.edu, um, our student relations coordinator, Michelle Bencomo, um, and I, it's Michelle at nmhu.edu, um, hers is an easy one, um, and so um, we're, we're happy to, as, as Robert stated, to um, answer any questions about if you're a prospective student or you may just want to uh, take a, a few classes to see what you're interested in, to, to gauge your interest, we're happy to support you um, in that regards. Um, I would like to, you know, perhaps leave, you know, um, some ad advice for our students. I, I, I think we're getting close to um, our end time here. Um, but really just look for, you know, I, and I speak from my own experience, look for opportunities as they're presented. They may not always be as we envision them, um, but look at for those opportunities and embrace them when you're able to. You know, if that's, you know, getting, uh, dipping your toe into the waters of HU and say, I want to try one class and see how it goes, uh, see if this is for me. Look at that as an opportunity. Um, I also, um, I encourage um, students, uh, prospective students to always find ways to challenge yourself, uh, both personally and professionally. I think, you know, um, myself being a lifelong learner, um, not just, you know, educationally, but also in life, I think it's important to always, you know, challenge ourselves to learn something new always, to push our own limits of, of possibilities, um, and really just believe in yourself um, and, and, and know that, I, I say this again, I did it, you know, um, you can do it. Robert's done it. We have tons of these examples. Um, higher education is not beyond your reach. There's um, a lot of um, people at HU who care, the Highlands family, and, and really want to um, really want to support, you know, all our students, but in particular, our students of Northern New Mexico um, to get that education. Cause we recognize that, and, and I speak from my own personal experience, that Highlands truly uh, transforms lives for generations to come. My children's lives are going to be different because of the Highlands education that my husband and I received. And I know numerous stories of, of the Highlands story and, and how that's um, happened. Um, and just, you know, Really see the sense of possibility in yourself. We see it in you. We want you to believe it as well. So thank you well, so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Blea and Robert. We have uh, had a wonderful morning with you. Uh, lots of information, a wealth of information for our listening audience and for students, prospective students out there. I see our time is about up, but final thoughts, Robert, and then we'll uh, move over to uh, Dr. Blea. No, I think Dr. Blair, you did a great job encapsulating uh, what we do at Highlands. Uh, here, here, good, good work, and congratulations to you and your family for all of your achievements and the work you do for uh, center and campus students, campus wide. And so uh, we appreciate you. Um, my email raanaya at nmhu.edu, and my phone number five zero five four two six. 2130. Uh, go to the website www.nmhu.edu. 
www.edu. Check us out. We'll do everything we can to help you uh, with uh, getting on your path and your journey to completion of whatever program of study uh, you have your interest in. So thank you so much. And thanks to KSWV. I, I would do a shout out to our former border regent and former mayor of the city of Santa Fe. He, he was one of the individuals, uh, uh, Mayor Gonzalez, that, that actually helped Viles and, and uh, Viles and Crimen, is that? Uh, Crimen. Doc? Crimen, Viles yep. and Crimen get off the ground and get constructed. He was, he was the chair of the board of regents of, uh, that kind of worked on that initiative. So shout out to him for those efforts, but uh, th thanks to you, Esteban, and your team as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Dr. Blaya and Robert and Naya. We really appreciate you and everything that you guys are doing, everything that New Mexico Highlands University is doing, all the faculty and staff and we're just getting really excited and we're hoping that the trend continues uh, with this progress being made in the pandemic so that we can get to campus uh, very, very uh, quickly and soon. Uh, but in the meantime, God bless you and your families and keep you safe. And thanks for being with our listening audience today. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.